The last humans to visit the moon left the lunar surface in Apollo 17 at 5.55 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on December 14th, 1972. Since then, no humans have been any further than low Earth orbit missions and to the variety of space stations that have existed since then. The question is now, where shall we go next? Do we make Mars the next great step forward or do we go back to the moon? This time, it's not down to the space race or national pride, but it's in expanding man's horizons to living elsewhere in the solar system other than on the Earth, and maybe even making a profit while doing so. Even before the Apollo missions had finished, Werner von Braun, the designer of a Saturn V moon rocket, wanted NASA to mount manned missions to Mars, and the Soviets were also drawing up their own plans to send men to Mars too. But by the early 1970s, the huge cost of the space race, the warming in relations between the US and the Soviet Union, and the change of direction by NASA from the Moon to manned space stations and the space shuttle effectively ended manned space exploration beyond low Earth orbit. And Mars, which was always a much more difficult challenge, was off the agenda. However, the exploration of the solar system didn't stop from the 1970s onwards, robotic probes and satellites have been sent to all the planets. In fact, there have been 40 Mars missions to date. These included orbiters, landers and rovers, but only 18 of them have actually been successful. Man has had a long-held fascination with Mars, going back to the Romans. And although Mars is not the closest planet to the Earth, that is actually Venus, it is the most Earth-like. In 1877, Giovanni Schiaparelli reported that he saw long, thin lines on the Martian surface. He called these canali, which means channels in Italian. Not long after, the noted astronomer Percival Lowell picked up on these and through his own observations came to believe that Mars must have been not unlike the Earth in the past and these canals were the work of intelligent beings trying to irrigate the surface. By the turn of the 20th century, the canals of Mars had become one of the most intense obsessions in the history of science. And although it was later proven to be completely incorrect, it captured the public's imagination through numerous newspaper and magazine articles of the time. This led to classic sci-fi books like A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs and The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. This fascination with the possibility that Mars could have once been like the Earth and that life may still exist is one of the main driving factors behind sending manned missions there. NASA has said that its aim is to land humans on Mars during the 2030s, but many question their ability to do this considering the agency's budget and the proposed use of expensive Apollo-style expendable rockets. Meanwhile, Elon Musk says that his SpaceX will start sending unmanned cargo flights to Mars starting in 2018, and then every 26 months thereafter. These will be for future colonists to use, which he says could be following as soon as 2024 to arrive in 2025. Compared to the Earth, living on Mars would not be an easy task. There are a lot of technical issues to overcome, let alone the human condition and how that would affect the Mars colonists psychologically. So let's have a look at some of the hurdles that any manned mission to Mars would have to overcome. Firstly, there is the problem of just getting to Mars. Earth and Mars are on differing elliptical orbits at different speeds. At their closest points, this can vary between 36 and 60 million miles and occurs roughly every two years. Between those times, the distance can increase up to 250 million miles. This allows for only a narrow launch window and if launched at their closest approaches and with current rocket technology, the journey to Mars is around 150 days one way. And this brings us on to one of the major issues of a very long space journey, radiation. It's maybe just as well that we didn't send men to Mars in the 1970s and 80s after the Apollo missions. 
because they would have almost certainly died en route due to the interplanetary radiation. Probes and robots which have been sent to Mars over the years have revealed just how deadly interplanetary space and the surface of Mars really is. Armed with this new information and the advancement of technology in the years since Apollo, we have been able to create new radiation absorption technologies for the spacecraft and crew to protect them from solar radiation. There are also ways to deflect charged particles from the sun, like high energy protons and solar alpha particles, by creating electromagnetic fields around the spacecraft in the same way as the Earth's magnetic field protects us. But once you're out into deep space and beyond the protection of the Earth's magnetosphere, there is another equally dangerous form of radiation called galactic cosmic rays. These are high energy charged particles which are believed to originate from places like the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, supernovae, quasars and gamma ray bursts, which could be up to millions of light years away. These particles were first observed by the Apollo crews as flashes of light which they saw even with their eyes closed as the particles went through the walls of the spacecraft and hit their retinas or optic nerves. Galactic cosmic rays arrive in our solar system from every angle and can easily pass through spacecraft and human tissues. These pose two problems. Firstly, when they strike some of the spacecraft materials, they can give off powerful X-rays and create slower secondary ionizing radiation like neutrons. And secondly, like neutrons, they can rip apart the molecules that make up human tissue and DNA. This can lead to cancer later, but more worrying for the crew is that new research has shown that they can damage brain cells at the molecular level causing symptoms similar to Alzheimer's. This may take months to manifest itself, but the long journey to Mars would easily be enough time to create permanent brain damage if the crew were not protected sufficiently. When you arrive on Mars, the problems don't stop there. Mars itself has no global magnetic field like the Earth to deflect these energetic particles and the thin atmosphere provides little in the way of protection too. So any habitats will still need to shield the occupants from radiation on the surface and will probably need to be underground. Although Mars has a 24.6 hour day that matches the 12 hour day-night cycle of Earth, it has only 37% of the Earth's gravity and it is still not known what long-term exposure to this low gravity environment will do to the human body. The atmosphere of Mars is 96% carbon dioxide with only 0.13% of oxygen compared to the Earth's 20% oxygen levels. Its atmospheric pressure is also just 0.6% of that on the Earth, which technically could be called a vacuum. You would have to wear a pressure suit with an air supply to walk around on the Martian surface. A failure of the suit system would mean death within minutes if you could not get back to a safe habitat. Add to this, the average temperature is around minus 55 degrees Celsius, although in the Martian summer, the temperature at the equator can reach 20 degrees Celsius. In the winter, at the poles, it's as low as minus 125 degrees Celsius. There are also huge dust storms that can spring up at any time and last for months. These can cover vast areas of the planet's surface, blocking out most of the sunlight which would render solar panels, the staple power generation for most spacecraft, useless. You would have to bring your own nuclear powered generators if you wanted a reliable source of electrical power for your stay and before you could split water ice into hydrogen and oxygen for rocket fuel. Then we have the problems that humans have when living under extreme conditions. The nearest we have to Mars on Earth is Antarctica, which has a slightly warmer average temperature of minus 49 degrees Celsius, a breathable atmosphere, plenty of fresh water and no radiation. But many of the scientists that work all year round in Antarctica suffer from a mental health disorder called winter over syndrome which is characterized by symptoms such as depression, irritability, aggressive behavior, insomnia, and memory problems. 
with the long journey to and from Mars and a prolonged or permanent stay, these conditions could be a lot worse. Performing mission critical tasks or just the manual job of building a colony under these conditions would be extremely testing even for the best. So whilst there is the urge to follow in Apollo's footsteps with an audacious Mars mission, many countries are looking to the moon again, but this time to build manned bases, develop technologies and use the moon as our launch pad to the rest of the solar system. Another reason to revisit the moon is the cost is significantly lower, especially if there is the potential of a huge profit to be made by mining it for rare and valuable resources. Mars on the other hand will be a massive financial black hole. In comparison to Mars, the moon is a much easier place to get men to. We've already done it with Apollo, but the longest we stayed on the lunar surface was for just over three days with Apollo 17. This new age of lunar exploration will be a much more permanent affair. Now you would think that as the previous leaders in lunar exploration, NASA and the USA would be at the front of the queue heading back to the moon, but that may not be how it's going to happen this time around. NASA had plans to go back to the moon with the Constellation program, but those were scrapped in 2010 by the Obama administration in favour of a flexible path approach to space, starting with landing a manned mission on a near-Earth asteroid first and then a manned Mars mission. The next lunar expeditions will be a much more international affair, with both Russia and China having said that they will build permanently manned lunar bases, and the European Space Agency has said that it's interested in developing its moon village concept with other international partners. At around 237,000 miles and with a journey time of around about three days, establishing a lunar colony would be a lot easier undertaking as supply rockets can be sent on a regular basis as well as shuttling people to and from Earth. There is still the radiation issue from high energy protons as you fly through the Van Allen belts, but these are not difficult to shield against, and this has already been done with the Apollo missions. Once on the moon, there is no atmosphere or protective magnetic field, so radiation is still going to be a problem. Most of the plans put forward for lunar bases are underground structures which would give the inhabitants more protection from the solar and cosmic radiation. As there is no atmosphere, there is also no weather or any other obstructions like the Martian dust storms to block the sunlight required to use solar panels. However, the moon takes 29.5 Earth days for it to complete one rotation relative to the sun. If you had lunar bases on the moon's equator where the Apollo missions landed, it would be light for almost 15 days and then dark for the next 15. Just as the area where the Apollo missions landed at the equator was flat, the poles of the moon are quite mountainous with deep craters. And unlike the Earth, the moon tilts over at only 1.54 degrees, so that the lunar polar regions stay in almost permanent sunlight on the high points of the North Pole and the floor of the deep craters of the South Pole, where the sun never shines, is the coldest place in the solar system, where the temperature is around minus 243 degrees Celsius and where water ice is believed to exist in large amounts. But it's not just the water that could be used to make rocket fuel that the lunar prospectors are interested in. There are other resources like helium-3, which is the main fuel candidate for future nuclear fusion reactors. This is extremely rare on Earth, but is believed to exist in large quantities on the surface of the moon. This helium-3 would be worth hundreds of billions of dollars as a new fuel source and the Chinese have said that it will be one of their primary goals once they are on the moon to mine for helium-3. 
So with all this new interest in the moon from Russia, China, India and the Europeans, it seems strange that the US would just let everybody else take the initiative. But, as they say, a week is a long time in politics, so over six years since Obama said that the moon was off the table is almost an eternity. Recent Congress hearings have been very critical of NASA's Mars initiative, attacking it for its clarity and cost, which is likely to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars, and with a narrowing budget it's hard to see how it will come to fruition. In a draft of the new appropriations bill for NASA, Congress would look to remove the funding for the asteroid mission and put the focus back on the moon, which can be done with current technology and working with the private space sector. So with a new president arriving soon, and many wanting to see America great again, NASA may well be on a new flexible path back to the moon much sooner than would have been thought possible a few years back, and Mars may end up being the first celestial body to be visited by a private space company. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then please thumbs up, subscribe, share and comment. And don't forget, we have other videos available which you may also find interesting on the link which is showing now. So until the next time, it's goodbye from me.